G'day everyone, it's James Davis from the Pax Aid Academy down here in the APAC again and I've got Paul Sargent, better known as Sarge to, to a lot of people from South Director Central. Thanks for joining me, Sarge. My pleasure, mate. Good to have the chat. This is a this is an exciting chat, I hope, because it's all gonna be all about sales and it's a topic that a lot of um, MSP and business techno uh, technology business owners shy away from and i really want to shine the light on some of the the challenges in the business and be better to talk to than you with so much so much experience thanks mate appreciate the introduction well, let's dive in i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you a, a tough question what what does a high performing sales and account management team look like for a technology business what, what are they doing what are they achieving what are the sort of outcomes of that yeah, yeah. There's, there's there's a really short answer and a really long answer. Let's get one in between. Um, the the high performance sales team is one that fundamentally, and this is sort of the, the just the bottom line, fundamentally focuses on value. They're not focused on product, a services catalog, and all the nitty gritty features and functions that we as a business are so proud of what we built, and we think that we're selling and selling is telling. And so they go out there and they tell, tell, tell the best salespeople ask the best questions and take the best notes. And the best sales teams focus on the client, the client's problems and how we solve those problems. And so it's a value-based conversation that can only happen if I've got two ears and one mouth. And the sales departments that are the best should be renamed listening and problem-solving departments. I like that. I, and I, I, I've seen myself like the best, you know, the, the salespeople I respect the most, they're not actually selling. They're having a conversation, they're getting, they're understanding and they're helping solve the problems. And what you just said there around, it's not actually about the features and the technical side at all. It goes against a lot of our business. So we're trying to build that sort of value-based sales and account management department. What, what, what do we need to put in place to, to drive that? Yeah, the, 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 the focus on, um, for most technology companies, MSPs are the same. It is, what is it? it? It's internally focused. And the sales training that I see happening in technology companies is all about our product. And for an MSP, it's all about our services catalog. Um, and it's about going out and telling the client all the great things that we can do. Whereas the, that fundamental piece that needs to happen is that the sales rep needs to be given the, the right time and the right training, the right coaching to ask insightful questions. Now, quite often, the best MSP account managers and to a degree, the new business development managers are very, very technically focused. Because there's a complexity to what we do that requires some level of understanding and some background. And often I see those sales reps are so caught up in that level of detail and knowledge that their self-worth comes from, like a consultant, I know a lot of stuff and I want to let you know that I know a lot of stuff. Whereas the best way for a client to understand and appreciate that you know a lot of stuff is to buy the, asking them questions where they go, ah, good question. Ah, didn't think about that. Yeah, haven't really considered that. And so the, the technique that I find in those really good sales reps as, as a building block is that they, they, they don't want it. They're not driven by, I'm the smartest person in the room. They're driven by, I want to help you. And I'm not selling to you. I'm helping you buy. And so what MSPs are selling is a service that every organization needs as opposed to some other technologies which only 10% or 5% or 3% of, of companies need. But every company needs the services of an MSP, obviously size-related. And so if, if the fundamentals of the sales team is about a really solid discovery process and as sales leaders and owners and founders of the business, we're encouraging our sales process to map the way that clients buy, which is I need to be understood 
before I'm even going to open the door for you to sell to me. And so there's this tipping point that's, that, that, that high performance sales teams know they need to get to, which is I need, to, uh, I need to learn before I earn, right? I need to learn about the client and what their problems are and really make them feel I've understood where they're at and what it is that they need before I even think about positioning our service catalog or the products and solutions that, that I have. And so the first point is just a recognition from everyone in the sales environment that we're not out there push, push, push. We're actually out there to understand. Now, with, um, with MSPs, you've got a ready-made yearly um, annual business review and then quarterly business reviews that are ideally set up for that discovery. And so the first thing I would look at is change your annual business reviews and your quarterly business reviews from being, here's the SLAs, here's what we've done, here's the new products that we've got into, how's your business going? What are the new strategies that your business is taking forward? And so turn the conversation into a conversation about the business. What comes with that is we, we say you get referred to who you sound like. And so if you're selling into an organization and you sound like a technical person, you'll be talking to a technical person. But if you ask business questions, all of a sudden you'll find that you'll have CEOs and C-suite the executives in those meetings because today more than ever technology has moved from being something that's in the back room that some people in the organization had to use to technology is inherent in everything that gets done and so if you can start to think about technology just not as the old-fashioned IT but as the new technology is key to how businesses operate you just have a fundamental shift so that's that whole that sort of your question has so many components to it in terms of the answers, but I'll just pause there in terms of that's the fundamental first piece. I think a lot of uh, owners will like hearing that because I think a lot of the time they do think they need to sell through the technology and the, the bells and whistles because they don't they don't know any different. Like we've all built our businesses organically. We, we've had to be the sales and we think that's how we sold our services in the past, yeah. but actually it's not. And yeah. so, yeah, this is, this flows into that sales team. So I know you mentioned uh, uh, an important piece that I'd like to delve into a bit. You mentioned sales process and the, the decision-making buyer, buyer's journey. When you say sales process, I think when everyone hears that word, they default to like really operational stuff where you used to really dri process driven businesses. When you say sales process, what do, what do you actually mean? So there's three terms to, to be unpacked around that. There's sales process, sales methodology, and sales framework. And so I've, I've, I've done a, um, a post on this uh, and a detailed blog on the website as well. Um, a sales process are the operational steps we take as we progress from lust to dust, cradle to grave, um, I'm interested, lead into closed and then ongoing um, ongoing engagement. So that's the sales process. And it is something like um, uh, get a lead, qualify the lead, do a discovery, do a presentation, do a proposal, blah, blah, blah. That's a sales process. So it is, you're right, operational, they're the steps I take. Sales methodology is what is the methodology that we apply throughout the sales process to enable us to talk to people that are going to make a buying decision? Because time is our most precious commodity in sales. It's the thing that we don't measure that we should measure. So many people measure activity. How many discovery calls have you been on? How many demos have you done? How many presentations have you done? How many proposals have you written? That's all measuring activity. We want to actually measure the the, the qualitative or the time-based side of that. So how many discoveries have you done to people that are completely and properly qualified into being in our target market and that can make a buying decision in the time frame that we're looking at? And so the methodology is the approach I take. There's, thing, there's BAD, there's Medic, there's Sales Challenger, um, there's Taz. There's, there's, I think last count we did, there were about 30, 30 of them, which is a sales methodology. So it's a way to qualify a deal and it's a way to help you navigate 
to understand what you don't know you don't know. Because we're selling a complex solution into what we would describe as an infrequent buyer. They're probably only buying this service every three years at most, but often every 12, 15 years. And so there is a complexity to the sale that we need a methodology that helps us determine are we selling to the right people? Have they got the budget? All that sort of, at best, the easiest one that, that yeah, have I got the budget and access and and uh, and so forth. So it's it's really about that's the the methodology which works within the process. And then the ones that it gets forgotten the most, and we've tested this over the last four years with eighty clients, is what we call a sales leadership framework. And so that is within the meth within that sales process. What's the overall framework of how we're going to conduct ourselves as a sales team? So in those two things I've spoken about, sales process and sales methodology, there is no discussion about what's the planning we're going to do going into a new year. What are the territories we're going to focus on, geographical, vertical, however you want to describe it, industry-based? Um, how many reps do we need? What is each rep's territory plan going to look like? Who are their target 20, 30 accounts? Or be it new business or be it existing accounts, what's that going to be? If if I'm targeting a new account or I've got five or six really big accounts, what's my account plan going to be? None of that sits inside sales process and none of it is part of methodology. And so we talk about a sales leadership framework, which has got to be driven by the leaders of the business, which covers planning. It covers accountability. So if I'm planning something or I'm doing a meeting or I commit to something, how are we going to hold people accountable for the actions? And so we might do deal reviews and things like that as part of accountability. Um, methodology sits in there. Indicators or KPIs are important too because it's like how are we going to measure how we're performing? We want leading and lagging indicators and we want not just measurement of activity but measurement of quality and time effective activity. Um we want a regular cadence of that. What's the point of doing all this if we don't have a regular sales meeting? And then there's execution. And so that, that's called PAMICE, P-A-M-I-C-E. That's, that's the framework that we drive or work with our clients to implement the components. Um, I'll just give you an example. Most sales meetings that we see is the sales team sits around with the sales leader and everyone goes around the room and it takes between one hour and four hours every week, two weeks or month, typically every week, and everybody has the floor for a period of time until they finish talking about what they want to talk about. I've gone this, I've done this, I've seen this, I've done that. That's a waste of everybody's time. An effective sales meeting, if you've got 10 reps, you've got five reps, you can do that, all of them, in less than an hour. And so that's one of the things we talk about in terms of accountability, cadence, and execution is let's make let's get our sales meetings, which can waste a lot of time in a business, down to what were the deals that we did this week or this month or this quarter, whatever time period I'm managing, and why did they make a decision to go with us? Everybody gets something out of that that's in that sales meeting. They know what we're winning, they know who we're winning, and they know why we're winning. And I'm gladly, oh, as a sales rep, I'll gladly sit through an hour of listening to that, not listening to Paul and James and everybody talk about who they met, who they didn't meet. And then everybody in the sales team only talks if they've won something. Or the next step would be if they've got something to forecast. I'm going to, I'm committing to doing that. And so the sales meeting is a bit bigger of agenda than that. But the sales meeting gets really focused and we, we are protecting time of everybody. It's time to go through pipelines in one-on-ones, but that's that's the process into methodology into framework. I, I can I can see how that fosters uh, successful sales mm. because they know where they fit in and they can focus on um, what they need to do with the clients and prospects um, yeah. to get it, and they've got the support system to to learn from that and. Most business owners I come across don't have all of them, let alone probably one of them, one of those areas covered. So, so from your experience, um, you know, flip this a bit on the other side. Yeah. Probably pretty easy to see non-performing sales team, but what are the what are the sort of um, traits that you see of the average um, technology business sales and account management team that they're not high performing, 
they're not really l low performing. They're so somewhere in the middle. They're a bit average. They're a bit me mediocre, and they're not doing well. Like, what are the symptoms and signs that that's happening? Yeah, yeah we we do a uh, when we first walk into an organisation, um, we do a fifty point checklist against a sales framework. Um, so we've got some really good understanding of, of what good looks like and what bad looks like and, and sort of get a, a benchmark score out of 100 um, against those PAMIS areas plus value. Most organizations that we go into, the majority of them would be poor to average. Right? And they do very, very little planning. So the business owner sitting there saying, I want $10 million worth of revenue next year. And the sales team's going, I'll just go and sell 10 million bucks worth of stuff. But there's no thought that goes into it that says, well, hang on, $10 million of revenue we need, means we need to recognize $10 million of revenue. So I might have a backlog of 5 mil. I've got to deliver another $5 million of net new revenue in this year, which probably means I need to sell somewhere between 10 and 15 million over the year so I can recognize all that revenue in this year and achieve the $10 million business goal. Very little thought goes into just that little piece. And so sales reps end up with targets um, that are, I don't know, somewhat manufactured, um, commission plans that aren't thought through properly. Um, let's pay them 8%. Why are we paying 8%? Let's pay them on gross margin. Well, why gross margin? What sort of behavior do you want to drive from gross margin? Maybe we better driving them on revenue. Can they influence gross margin? Well, no, because gross margin is defined at the time we sell the deal. They've got no influence over the net gross margin of the actual gross margin when it's delivered. Well, so why are we, why are we doing sales reps like that? And th those sorts of conversations around the planning cycle, that's the in-depth stuff that's just missing in most, in most, most teams. Like there might be some high-level planning, um, but just scratching the surface and asking those questions as a business, what do we need to deliver as a sales team, what do we need to deliver to support the business? Um, we we see um, a very poor qualification um, mentality. Um, a lot of organisations, by far the majority of organisations, struggle for leads. And if you struggle for leads, you want and you crave any activity. Whereas a high-performance sales team only wants activity that's going to lead to a deal. And and it's and I know I've gone back into sales speak there. I'm, I'm like hungry sales rep, hungry account manager, wants to sell, 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 commission, commission, commission. But if you go into that with a mindset of I'm helping a whole, um, a whole group of organizations make a buying decision that's right for them, I don't want to spend time with that group of organizations where that buying decision is right for them. And so qualification ends up being something that gets, gets swept under the, under the carpet or gets very, very uh, loosely done. Um, so almost every organization we go into, the first thing we would do is introduce more formal, um, more formal uh, methodology, qualification methodology, to make sure that they are dealing with those organizations that can make a buying decision. Uh, I know I've got some personal clients um, that... That's one of the big issues that we, we've had to face is there's not a lot of leads and there gets a bit of a mentality sometimes of, of the account manager in particular just being an order taker. Um, and so the challenge to move from average to great is don't be an order taker. When that order comes in, let's qualify it properly. Now, qualification doesn't mean, um, no, I'm not going to sell you those 20 laptops. Qualification means, why do you want those 20 laptops? Why do you want them now? What would happen if you didn't get the 20 laptops, right? It's asking a bunch of questions that shows the client you're really interested in them. And you might uncover, you might have to ask it 20 times, 30 times for different clients, but you might uncover, oh, we need 20 laptops because we've opened a new division and that new division is going to be moving to a new location. Okay, can we help you with a network? Blah, 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 blah. It, it, we've got to be asking qualifying questions all the time. We, we, we'll constantly say ABQ, always, always be qualified. So that's, that's probably that and the lots of chat in the sales team meetings that don't really mean anything. They're probably the three things, the planning, qualification, and the, and the meetings. They're probably the three things that we see when we look at average. And you're just touching on the order taker. I love that. I challenge that on MSPs all the time. Is, yeah. Do they just have order takers and why are they paying so much for 
auto takers. Exactly. What well, can you describe an auto taker? Because I think I, I think because a lot of people aren't in the in the sales and account management realm, yeah. that that term has a meaning. But what what does it actually what does it actually mean when when we say that? So when I refer to an auto taker, it's a it's typically an account manager. Um, it's um, th- their role is to look after X number of accounts, typically in the sort of twenties or thirties. Um, their role is to represent the client internally in our organization and is to represent our organization into the client's organization. So all that um, uh, inquisitiveness and question and all that sort of stuff has to be there because you've got to know about the client. The order taker does none of that. They've got a couple of relationships in the business that are typically at a lower level because they're the people that are constantly asking for a new laptop or a couple of new licenses. And they sit at a very comfortable uh, middle management level within their clients, and they just sit there and take orders. They're very quick to respond to quotes um, and requests for proposal, whatever it happens to be the mechanism. And they help the people in their, in their clients to get their orders quickly, and they work internally to get their orders prioritized and sent out to the client. So client wants 20 laptops tomorrow, Bish, bash, bosh, 20 laptops turn up tomorrow. They want, you know, 10 new Microsoft D5 licenses this afternoon. Bang, they get that done. They don't dive into the depths of the organization they're working with so that when they get asked for those five new E5 licenses, that they can ask insightful questions about why they need them or why they need the 20 laptops. So so my experience is, a lot of those people in the cap manager positions in MSPs. Yeah. Um, are, those, are those kinds of people trainable? Are they? Do they have the right personality to move up the stack? Do they have enough experience? Like, I, it, from your experience, seeing these sort of order taker account managers, are they are they the right people for what we need? Yeah. Good question. I'll take a step back. Um, the market. If you've got an existing sales rep, the best outcome for everybody, if they're not performing very well, the best outcome for everybody is that they become a high-performance sales rep. And so the mindset we go in with is not a massive stick. It is, it's carrot, it's mentoring. So we don't call ourselves sales trainers, right? Sales trainer, you send them off training, sales techniques, all that sort of stuff. They come back in the office, they ignore it. You haven't shifted the dial one piece. We talk about what we do more as mentoring. And so we're... We get engaged by the typically by the founder or the owner of the business or even the sales leader, uh, and they say, I've got a problem with my sales team. I want to be a high-performance sales team. Um, and these three reps aren't working well, and these four or five are working well. We drill into that. Sometimes the best sales reps are the best sales reps because the sales leader likes them and they get the best leads, or they've got the best suite of accounts. And so we, we need to unwind all of that. And and sometimes the, the, the poorer performing sales reps are the ones that have just had a not the best time there and it just hasn't worked. So we the, the starting point for us is to try and work with them and to try and turn that order taker or the, the one who's um, not performing as well as we like and, and, and help them become a, a top performing rep. That's our mentality. But not all of them are going to make it. Not all of them are going to make it. Um, some uh, order takers have just, yeah, they've watched a movie or read a book about sales and they think, I've said it at the start of this, selling is telling, and they just chat, 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 chat. And it's all about how much I know. And when they ring up about the laptop, it's like, do you want a 20 meg or do you want a, this sort of, you know, Intel thing or whatever it happens to be. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but, but, um, the, their their worth is about what they know about technology, and they just take the order, have some conversation about whether it's the right technology, but they don't take the time to understand the business aspect of it. We want to always understand the client has a business reason for doing something, and we want to get to that business reason because that talks to value. And if we can continually deliver value to the client, the client will stay with us forever. And you see those order takers, they end up getting um, the the exclusivity about what they're doing wanes over time. 
oh, you're charging me 20 grand for 20 laptops. I've just been to Harvey Norman or, or, or wherever, and I can get them for 20% off. That's the best indication you ever get as a sales leader that your sales rep, your account manager, is adding zero value if you're being compared to a retail, a retail price. They're adding no value whatsoever. And so we weed all through that. So some of them know they can't because they can't shift from um, that technology sell and technology understanding into more of a business conversation. We've had pretty good success in turning them because most of them actually want to do better and want to do more. They just sort of fall into that as that's just the way we do it. And so by challenging some of these things, they'll come along for the ride and you get some really good outcomes. But you can also get some outcomes, which are good for the business as well, but not so good for the individual. What's the, um, just as a rough percentage, in you, you hearing, hearing you saying that, like quite a few come along the ride. When, when you are doing sort of mentoring, or what is the percentage that come on the ride and grow and, and flourish from that sort of mentoring? 60%? In more than 50? More than 50, but not much more. Not much more. Quite, yeah. quite, often, quite often those reps too, they actually don't want to go on the ride and they're quite happy that somebody calls them out and the business has a real conversation. So it could be, I'm an order taker. Okay, why don't you drop back and be an inside sales rep? Right? We're not going to pay you mega bucks. We're going to pay you this. We're going to give you a different commission plan. And they're quite happy that, yeah, but you're happy to do that. Others just fall back into it because they're not interested in the business that much. And if you help them move along, they're like, you know, you can tell, you know, I've, I've spoken to sales reps and I asked the question, do you enjoy coming into the office? This is pre-COVID, you can tell. But do you enjoy coming into the office in the morning? Um, and, and some will go, no, I hate it. And it's like, what are you doing here? Oh, yeah, maybe I'm just too lazy to move. I said, well, why don't we help you move? Because it's going to be the better outcome for me. If you don't really want to be here and you're not performing, why are we all doing this charade? And now HR will jump up and down and probably have a big chat to me about that. <laughs> but I think you can still have honest conversations. I think it's needed. I, I think there is there is a lot of complacency around the sales and what you would do. what you were explaining there with the auto taker uh, concept. Um, I, my mind went to the whole. Well, actually, if they're good at that and they enjoy that, and they actually really there is that sales support role that uh, a business needs. Um, yeah. you know, if you've got a bunch of account managers, it's better them going and speaking to the clients and providing on that value and having something someone running around doing orders for them yeah that's right it's a, the, um but I, I suppose a lot of ms uh, especially msps and the smaller you know si's and stuff they don't have a big sales team so yeah try and fit fit everything to one person um uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is it is tougher james for that smaller organization because they almost need that unicorn account manager who can do everything and that's harder whereas the larger ones can have the i've got the relationship and the business-focused account manager, and then I've got the technical team that sits underneath and supports them. So I, I do see that in some of the smaller ones that just getting that volume um, to be able to support a broader-based uh, sales team, it can be can be difficult. Um, but that's where you've got to have the team because some members might be better at having that outbound conversation and others better at the technical, and they just need to support each other while, while the business grows. So... When we're talking measurement, like you, you mentioned a few times with like KPIs and stuff, but let, let's focus on the account manager to start with. What would you? What do you typically measure them on um, for being an account manager? I, I, it is case by case, and we work across a number of different technology organisations. So we work with MSPs, we work with SaaS, um, pure SaaS software um, uh, uh, players and uh, some more complex IT services organizations. And so it, it does change a bit across that. Um, I, the, the conversation I, I start to have is what's leading and what's lagging. And so um, a leading indicator that I like to have is qualified pipe, just as a starter. So if I've got my qualification right, it's not the size of the pipe. The pipe is fine, and, and that's a measure I might have. But one of the first ones I look at from a leading indicator is is a qualified pipe. 
And so a qualified pipe's been through a formal qualification process. I've had a call with them. It might have been a more detailed discovery call. And um, I, I look at um, what that qualified pipe is um, that can satisfy monthly, quarterly, yearly targets. So so that that's probably the first one that I look at. Um, that's an important one because if you take the average sales rep, they win one, they lose one, and there's no decision in one. And so if I'm really good at qualifying and get my qualified pipe, so it's clear to me that those that are making no decision, I can get out and I win one, lose one, I go from a one in three to a one in two. And so that's where qualified pipe really starts to help. So I look at that as a, when I get to lagging, it is of your qualified pipe, who made no decision and who lost? Because if we just lost to the competition, to a certain degree, that's like, yeah, okay, we've, we've done the right thing. We had a customer who's going to buy and, and okay, you, you win some, you lose some. The best sales reps don't lose too many. Um, because they'll qualify out ruthlessly from those where they don't think they've got a competitive advantage. And so they increase that where they're winning, where instead of winning one in three or one in two, they're winning, you know, four out of five. So that qualified pipe becomes that leading indicator, that, that leading indicator of what am I likely to win? And it's the lagging indicator of why did I lose and what can I learn from that? So that, and that all rests around qualification. Um, I, I don't like the ones which are just how many proposals have you put in? How many proposals were we asked to put in versus how many proposals did we say we've just had to, we've just, I'll send you a proposal. And so on proposals, we, we like for the client to ask for a proposal. Now, if you're selling to government, that's different because you've got a tender and that's part of your sales yep. process. It's a step you have to do it. If you're selling to private enterprise, Private enterprise doesn't always have to have a proposal. And if they do, we want them to ask for the proposal. And so what I'd like to see is how many proposals have we put in where we've worked with the client on what the audience is for the proposal and what they want in the proposal. Because if the client's working with us on what, who's going to get the proposal, because they only use the proposal to get a sign off. I don't and so who's part of that sign off? And so if I can see in my pipeline, I've got 20 proposals that have gone out the door and 10 of them we've worked with the client on the agenda, they've asked for it on the chapters and the, and the, and the makeup of it and we know who it's going to to make a decision versus proposals that we've just sent in to, to Fred and I think Fred's gonna take it through the business. They're vastly different indicators on our success. The proposal that I just sent out to James I'm hoping Pax8 is going to buy our services. If I've just sent that in, that's I'm not likely to win that because, or if I am, it's going to take three years for you to get it through all of Pax8. Whereas if I've been talking to you for six months or three months or whatever it happens to be, and then you've got me introduced to the country manager for Australia, and I've spoken to the country manager for Australia and the and the area VP, and then the global head of sales, and all three of you, and we said this is what we want in the proposal. How are you going to roll this out internationally? I've got a much higher chance of winning that one. It, it, it's sounding like um, it goes back to where you, you sort of said before around like the methodology, the process and the framework is having a lot more planning um, rather than a lot, lot of those lagging indicators, lagging metrics around the activity we've done. And I think um, a lot of owners in technology businesses struggle with this sort of management and measurement because they're so used to managing techs. It's a yes. ticket in, ticket out approach. Well, that's not sales, is it? That's, you, we shouldn't be measuring that kind of activity. You will like what you said is really, there's only a couple of outcomes that are, are really important from, from the side. That's right. And it's changing our mindset from we're selling into how do I understand how that customer buys? Now, from a government perspective, it's pretty much set down, right? How are they going to buy? But in, in a private enterprise, how are they going to buy? Right? What's And each company's got a different way of buying. So we want to understand what it is that they need to do to make a buying decision to go with our services for the next three years. And 
too often we rely on, I'm talking to James, James is being tasked with going out to market. I'm going to give a proposal to James and I'm done. James has got anywhere from three weeks to three years to get that proposal through the various levels of that organization and get the sign off. Um, you know, most, uh, we, we do some kickoffs for our clients and, and um, when we do the kickoff, we'll interview um, interview customers and also we'll do some loss reviews and interview the customer around that. And typically when we ask them for any any major decision, how many people are involved in the sign-off process, it's, it's more than 10 and it's up to 50. Most organizations for something that's complex, multi-million dollar that impacts multiple departments, every department has to, head has to sign it off. So you've probably got four or five department heads immediately in the exec team, um, and then levels in the in the C level need to sign it off. Um, CFO is going to sign it off. It's over a certain level. The CEO has to sign it off. Sometimes it has to go to the board. Which board meeting is it going to? What agenda? What what agenda number is it in that board meeting? Because if it's number ten, they won't get to it. That'll delay it another month. But it's just fantastic if you understand all of that, and and that's where the mindset goes from. My sales process, I'd put a proposal in. Next step is I should get one in three to be a shortlist. Into they've asked me for a proposal. I know who's making the decision. They've told me what they want in the proposal. And I've got, I'll get nine out of 10 at that level. So it's a big change, isn't it? Um, and I think, oh, I know we, we could talk about this for ages. You've got so much wisdom to, sh to share. And I, I, I hope everyone's got some gold nuggets out of this conversation to wrap up what what's the major takeaway that you want people to walk away from from this from this conversation there's probably two things that i want people to go away with one is try and go to a customer and not talk about your company and your products or your services right go try and have a conversation with your client about them and when you bring that back into the business as a sales leader, ask the sales rep just to talk about their customer. Most reps can't go for more than a minute. If you get a rep to talk for five minutes about their customer, they understand their customer. And then the other thing to take away is flip your mindset from scarcity to prosperity, which means at the moment when a lead comes in, they're automatically qualified in. And they have to do something pretty drastic to get qualified out most of the time. If you change your mindset to, I've got a really great service in my business and I'm going to protect that and, and, and make sure that the only people that get access to that are the ones that I've qualified in properly to get access to that because they need it and I don't want to waste their time on any pre-sales effort for anyone that's not a perfect customer for us. So you start with everybody qualified out and then make sure you ask all the questions so that you then qualify them in as opposed to everyone's in and I have to do something pretty drastic to qualify out. Those two things just change the way that you look, that, that you will look at sales. I, uh, that's awesome advice to, to, to wrap up. So thanks so much for your time, Sarge. And yeah, I really hope... Um, people have listened to this and um, they, they get a, they can transform their business from this type of information. Thanks so much for joining me, Sarge. My pleasure. Thank you.